Simply gabled houses and elaborate statuary, Danzig was and is still a typical Hanseatic town. According to German folklore, it had been settled by German tribes 2,000 years before. Its population was overwhelmingly German. Die Stadt Danzig war schon zur Zeit der Ordensritter ein Bollwerk des Deutschtums nach dem Osten. Mit der Blütezeit der Hanse wuchs ihre Bedeutung und ihr Wohlstand. Häuser und Tore sind Zeugen dieser stolzen Vergangenheit. Sie zeigen heute wie immer den urdeutschen Charakter dieser Stadt. The Danzig Germans were clamoring to join the Reich, and Hitler used their grievances, real and imagined, to stoke up a crisis. But he told his associates that Danzig was unimportant. It was to serve as a pretext for war. Ein Instrument war Danzig in zweifacher Hinsicht. Danzig was an instrument in two ways. First, with it Hitler was able to offer something to the Germans, namely a cure for their injured feelings. He could tell them, I brought back Danzig. But it was much more important as a tool to initiate the conflict with Poland. Um den Konflikt mit Polen auszulösen. By 1939, Hitler had freed Germany of most of the restrictions imposed by Versailles. He now turned to the greater objective he'd set out in his book Mein Kampf, the acquisition of living space. The key to that was Poland. The vast spaces lay in the east, so if Germany wanted to expand into a greater Reich, then it clearly had to be in the east. And historically, the first ones to do this were the German knights. Centuries ago, they built castles and established colonial rule in the East. And they had a strong missionary outlook. Nach Osten schallt der Ruf durchs Land. Deutsch Ritter nimmt das Schwert zur Hand. Vermehrt das Land, vermehrt den Wald. Schafft Raum der Heimat, Raum den Erben. In the last week of August, as Hitler thundered against alleged Polish provocations, a German naval training ship, the cruiser Schleswig-Holstein, arrived in Danzig on a courtesy visit. Das deutsche Schulschiff Schleswig-Holstein läuft zum Besuch der freien Stadt in den Hafen ein. Jubelnd empfangen die Danziger unsere Soldaten von der Kriegsmarine. Das wenn es weitere Unterdrückungsmaßnahmen gegen das dortige Deutschtum vornehmen würde, oder wenn Polen versuchen sollte, auf dem Weg zollpolitischer Maßnahmen Danzig wirtschaftlich zu vernichten, dass dann Deutschland nicht mehr länger untätig zusehen könnte. Directly opposite the Schleswig-Holstein's moorings, on the east bank of the Vistula, was a small Polish enclave called Westerplatte. Since 1925, Poland had maintained an ammunition depot there and a garrison of 88 soldiers and sailors. Franciszek Batoszak was one of them. On the 25th of August, the Schleswig-Holstein entered the port and stopped outside Westerplatte. The next day, it moved on about 450 meters. And on the 1st of September, at 4.45 a.m., it began the Second World War. There was this incredible explosion. We thought that the Westerplatte would disintegrate. They were all shouting, war, war. In spite of shelling at point-blank range from the cruiser's 11-inch guns, the Polish garrison at Westerplatte held out for a week. 
Also wir schliefen ganz normal, unsere Familie. Well, we were sleeping quite normally. We were a family of four with a shepherd dog. And at 4.47, suddenly shots and heavy artillery fire broke out. And my mother was first to wake up. Meine Mutter war die erste, die wach wurde. And my mother woke father. Father, father, Kurt, they're shooting, they're shooting. I heard father, ach, was? Ach, they aren't shooting, silly. Don't be silly. It's probably a thunderstorm. And then we could hear the second and third volley from the Schleswig-Holstein from the Westerplatte. And they were at least 28 centimeter gun turrets. And you could hardly not hear them. Simultaneously, in the city of Danzig itself, SS units attacked Polish installations, including the post office and its civilian staff. Ich muss dazu sagen, die elterliche Wohnung. I should tell you, my parents' flat in the old town was situated in direct line, about 400 meters away from the post office. Da waren nun zwei Schützenpanzer. And there were two armored vehicles outside, one called Tsar and the other one called Sudetenland which approached from one side as well as the other side. Ordinary Polish post office workers were firing back. Of course, they weren't soldiers. And as far as I know, after the fighting, they were taken off, tried and executed. Only after German troops had hosed down the building with petrol and set it on fire did the Polish postman surrender. Meanwhile, Hitler hurled against Poland a force of 52 divisions. 15 of them were armored or motorized. Speed and force of the German assault gave Poland no time to mobilize the whole of her army. About a quarter of a million men never reached their units. This was a revolution in warfare, devised to meet special German needs. Hitler wusste Hitler knew that Germany was not in a position to conduct a great and long-lasting war. There were many reasons. Enemies on all sides, material, military, and other shortcomings. And he asked himself, how can I manage it? And with a characteristic and astonishing turn, he said to himself that if a great and long-lasting war is not possible, we have to single out individual enemies to tackle them with a quick, concentrated blow, and so create the conditions for the next step. This, and nothing else, was fundamentally the whole idea of the Blitzkrieg. The Blitzkrieg. September was a dry month, and the German tanks sped across the sun-baked Polish plains. Clear skies allowed the Luftwaffe, especially the Stuka dive bombers, to find and attack anything that moved. On the fourth day of the war, the Polish government evacuated Warsaw, which had been heavily bombed. William Schara, who was based in Berlin as the correspondent of an American radio network, followed the Wehrmacht into Poland. All of us were surprised at how fast it went. I had been up in Poland uh, a couple weeks before the war and had been astounded about how backward their army was. Uh, they simply weren't prepared to fight a modern army such as the Germans had. So the Germans sliced through Poland using that new technique of uh, the Stuka dive bombers and the tanks driving through. Poland's army was decades out of date. The futility of horsed cavalry charges had been proved in the First World War. But many Polish generals distrusted the tank as likely to break down or run out of petrol. Poland had very few anti-tank guns and not a single armored or motorized division. Against Germany's highly mechanized forces, Poland's antiquated army never stood a chance. We were impressed by uh, the courage and the bravery of the Polish soldiers because they fought against the tanks and a very much superior German army, but they fought to their best and we were impressed by them, poor devils. And unfortunately, if I may say so, for the Poles, the, uh, the French and the British didn't attack Germany on the west. That probably was a mistake. 
When Britain and France declared war on Germany on September the 3rd, cheering crowds gathered outside their embassies in Warsaw. For both countries had undertaken in the event of war to come to Poland's aid. There was a huge demonstration outside both embassies, the French and in particular the British. Huge crowds gathered there and cheered the British ambassador and our foreign minister Beck, who came out onto the balcony with him. And it was he who gave this marvelous news, that we were not alone. In fact, we were alone until the end. From the first hours of the war, German planes had bombed undefended Polish cities. Many civilians were killed. In a formal guarantee, Britain had promised to support Poland immediately and by all means in her power. In practice, that meant bombing German targets. The promise was never kept. Listening to the British radio was pretty discouraging because the BBC news bulletins, to start with, seemed to give more coverage to the British football results than they did to the progress of the war. And when we were all hoping for news that the RAF had really bombed Germany in retaliation against the Luftwaffe's bombing of open cities in Poland, all we got was news of leafleted raids on the Ruhr. The whole thing was fairly hard to explain to our Polish friends who were watching, who were listening to the, uh, the news with us. The explanation was that the Chamberlain government was gearing up for a long war of attrition. Chamberlain had no desire for immediate offensive action. He ruled out even the bombing of German industry, arguing that Germany might retaliate against British cities and on the small British expeditionary force, whose first units were arriving in France. Once on the continent, the men of the BEF had little to do but wait. France, too, had obligations to Poland. La vie des champs continue en toute quiétude. Un peu partout, les soldats apportent leur aide aux travaux de la terre. As French soldiers helped bring in the harvest, their commander-in-chief announced that it would serve no purpose to break our tools in early battles hastily conducted. The fact was that the French army's mobilization system was hopelessly cumbersome. By the time enough reserves had been called up and their heavy weapons brought out of storage, Poland was on the verge of collapse. Everyone said that France would strike at any moment. We were deeply convinced that this would happen in a day or two, or a week. Hold out a little longer, a little longer, and there'll be a decisive strike which will completely change the situation. I'm firmly convinced. I belong to those army men who say that the Germans would have lost the war in September 1939 had the million-strong French army made a decisive strike in the West. This was what Hitler and the German generals always feared. The proportion of forces was at this time clearly in favor of the Allied forces of the Western Allies. Apparently, 110 divisions on the English and French side were facing about 25 divisions on the German side. Hence, a proportion of forces of approximately 4 to 1. The ratio, as General Jodl stated, was ridiculously to the disadvantage of the Germans. If England and France had attacked Germany at the time of the Poland campaign, or I believe three months later, up to the end of 1939, the German defeat would have occurred in 1939. Wäre die deutsche Niederlage schon 1939 eingetreten. 
I Francja i Wielka Brytania nie rozpoczęły działań ofensywnych. Neither France nor Great Britain began offensive action in September, but they did enter the war. And this meant that the Polish question stopped being merely a Polish-German conflict and became an element in a far broader conflict, initially European and later worldwide. A później światowego. The war widened dramatically when the armies of Soviet Russia crossed Poland's eastern frontier along its entire 1,000-mile length. It was a blow in the back that sealed Poland's fate. Caught between the German hammer and the Russian anvil, Poland was now to be partitioned and crushed. The victorious armies met at Brest-Litovsk. The city lay on the demarcation line agreed just before the war by Hitler and Stalin. It had been captured by the Germans and was to be occupied by the Russians. The commanding generals of the German and Soviet Russian troops took together the forbeimarsch of their formations. The handover followed a march past with German and Russian generals side by side on the saluting base. Polish civilians had been bombed and strafed by enemy planes. Tens of thousands now took to the roads to try and escape from a double invasion. Then we moved into the depths of Russia, and I remember as we walked east, eastwards to Wilno, how every so often we would meet groups of people coming the opposite direction, escaping from the Bolsheviks. They asked us, where are you going? They'll certainly kill you. Whilst we were asking, what are you going to do in the German area? The Germans will certainly murder you immediately. That was the horror story. Poles fleeing like hunted animals from one side to another, trying to save their lives. Within 48 hours of the Russian invasion, Polish forces in the east disintegrated and surrendered. Some 80,000 Polish troops escaped and continued the war from abroad. On the last day of the war, Colonel Gummins, who was my chief of staff, and I were going up to the Western Front, and we inquired our way from a Polish major who was standing beside the road and he turned out to be an artilleryman. And since my colonel was also a gunner officer, he asked if he could see his guns. And we were taken a short way away and shown some admirably dug emplacements. And when my colonel said, well, I see you seem very well sighted, uh, but where are the guns? Uh, the Pole said rather sadly, alas, the guns are still in England. For millions of Poles, there was no escape. The military campaign was over. Hitler's race war against the Polish people now began. It started with the segregation of Jews, who were herded into special areas and put to work for starvation rations, no more than 200 calories a day. Later, the special areas became death camps. Majdanek was one of the first, another was Auschwitz. Even the children were taken away. In many Polish cities, Jews lived in particular districts. These the Nazis enclosed. They became hunting grounds for SS troops. Sie werden überall sofort verhaftet und ihrer gerechten Strafe zugeführt. Polish civilians who had fought the invader were arrested and shot. The least act of resistance against the German occupation carried the death penalty. 
In the prisoner war camps, the Gestapo searched out Poles whom they accused of having mistreated members of the German minority. In den großen Gefangenenlagern wird das polnische Mordgesindel den misshandelten Volksdeutschen gegenübergestellt. An ethnic German points to a man he accuses of murdering his brother. Hier erkennt einer von ihnen den Mörder seines Bruders. Er wollte diese Räume erobern. He wanted to conquer these areas. But he also wanted in the terrible language the Nazis used to use, the immediate clearance of subhuman Slavs from these territories. ...von den sogenannten slawischen Untermenschen reinigen. Das heißt, es sollte die Führungsschicht ausgerottet werden. This had already begun in Poland and would continue above all in the Soviet Union. It meant the eradication of the ruling class and their replacement by the German master race. Under the Germans, there was to be an enormous mass of slaves, poor, uneducated, and without any national or social identity. All these people working for German ends. Der Deutschen dort für deutsche Zwecke und Ziele tätig waren. A Nazi propaganda film gave German cinema goers a glimpse of the scope of Hitler's dream of living space, Lebensraum. Ich sehe, wie sich da ausbreitet. Weit, 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 das ganze Land. Und wie es da wimmelt und sich regt. Vom Strande der Ostsee, wo sich die Föhren im Meerwind biegen und krümmen, bis zu den Karawanken, wo schon die Sonne des Südens niederbrennt. Vom Tiroler Land, wo der Wein hoch hinaufwächst, bis an die Brüder mit Nutze. 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 Wir haben eine Heimat. So schön. So groß. In Zamosch, in southeast Poland, the attentions of the Nazis are remembered with anguish to this day. Hitler had a special hatred for the Poles. They had defied his threats and fought his army. Poland, as a nation, would now be destroyed. He instructed his subordinates to keep the standard of living in Poland down, to eliminate Poland's Jews and its educated classes and use Poland as a source of labor. In Zamosh, still clearly marked today, is a transit camp set up by the Gestapo and security police. Thousands of Poles passed through this gate and never returned to their homes. One Jewess, a mother, had a four-year-old child with her. My grandmother was just passing by and the Jewess begged her, Pavlova, please take my child. But just then a German turned around and said, do you want to go along with the Jews as well? So my grandmother gave up and left, and the German turned on the Jewess who had wanted to protect her child, and held her arms and then beat the child with a whip. And so after the group of Jews had been beaten, they herded them in the direction of the church where there is a deep ditch. There was a hole dug there, and they were shot and thrown into it. Some of them still alive, and the remains are still there to this day. At the principal school in the Zamosh region, the Nazis developed a pilot project for racial segregation. Fair-haired and fair-skinned Poles were categorized as Aryan and transported to Germany. Those with dark hair were sent to the camps. Some of the children survived and recall what they saw 50 years ago. When we came here to this school, we were examined by a tall doctor. He took us by the arm and he turned us so. First one way, then the other. And with his hand, he felt the back of the head. He looked at our ears, he looked at our hands, just like so. Dark people were singled out and sent away to camps. 
fair-haired people were sent to Berlin to work. Even children were separated. A lot of people perished. One woman in the camp had a child wrapped in a blanket, a tiny child. This baby was five, maybe six months old. It was crying terribly because it was bitterly cold and hungry. A German grabbed this child from her, completely naked, and he went to a stone and started to hit it. The baby cried out, huh, in a dumb voice. The mother started crying out terribly. She ran up to the German and began kissing his legs. He kicked her, but she continued to kiss his legs, so he took out a pistol, kicked her, fired. And that was the way they settled accounts. Hitler's vision of a future Eastern Europe included the settlement of millions of Germans in areas to be cleared of what he lumped together as Poles, Jews, Slavs and Asiatics. I will create, he once said, a vast botanical garden in which German blood can breed. It was in Zamosh that the process began. Then the Germans brought carts and put us onto them, and they drove us through the whole length of the village. You could hear the cows lowing and the pigs squealing as there was nobody in charge any longer. And we drove through the local villages by a back route to avoid the German settlers who were moving into our farms. And we were taken to Zamost, to the barracks. Du Baraku. Auf dem Wege zum neuen Heim. Erste Besichtigung von Hof und Stall. In October 1939, Hitler told his generals that Poland would be the springboard for an attack on his new Russian ally. But before he could launch his war in the east, he needed to eliminate the enemy in the west. He wanted war so badly that he was prepared to overturn his whole original concept of war, namely a conflict with Poland and then with the Soviet Union, and no conflict with the west. And so he said, all right, I accept that I have to make war with the West, and I then shall turn with concentrated greater strength exclusively to the East. The Western offensive began in April 1940. Hitler invaded Norway and Denmark. Then the war spread to Belgium, Holland and France. Hitler's attack on France was a brilliant success. In numbers, his forces were inferior to those opposing them. His tanks were fewer and less powerful. Only in the air were the Germans superior to the Allies. What decided the war in the West was the Wehrmacht's use of tanks and dive bombers instead of slow-moving artillery to cut deeply into Allied lines, the Blitzkrieg again. After only six weeks of fighting, France sued for an armistice and German troops ran the flag up the Eiffel Tower. We had started very respectfully especially towards the French, in all that we knew about World War I and the French uh, fighting and so on and so on. It was certainly a tremendous victory and so tremendous that even we selves were surprised. Not so much about the victory, we thought we could get it, but about the time in which this victory was won. I was a young captain and as a young captain to be middle in such a battle, and not the battle, to, to, to really experience such a victory. I can hardly describe what I felt, but uh, uh, what is begeistered in English? Enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. An intervention in the final phase of the battle by Hitler himself allowed the bulk of the retreating British force to escape. 
As his tanks were about to enter Dunkirk, the last French port open to the British, Hitler held them up for three days. Eine B-Stelle an der Küste beobachtet die Flucht der feindlichen Flotte. Englische Zerstörer versuchen die fliehenden Transporter zu decken. Deutsche Flak ist schnell. Altogether, more than 300,000 British and Allied troops were brought safely back to England. Hitler at that particular moment did not want a war in the West at all. And he was still hoping, and he was hoping until the end of 1940, that Britain would give in. He had no, let me put it in this way, he had no particular war aims against France and Britain. They were simply in his way to the East. Hitler's action before Dunkirk, unexplained to this day, kept Britain in the war. After weeks of indecision, Hitler ordered preparations for an invasion. It would be launched after Britain had been softened up by the Luftwaffe under the direct command of Reich Marshal Göring. The Luftwaffe has here in höchste Maße mit dazu beigetragen, den Gegner zu schlagen und zu vernichten. Nun stehen wir am Abschluss des ersten Geschehens dieses gewaltigen Kampfes. Und was die Luftwaffe in Polen und Frankreich versprochen hat, wird diese Luftwaffe in England halten. Das heißt, auch hier wird sie den Feind treffen, schlagen und vernichten. told Hitler he would gain air superiority in four days. But in this respect at least, Britain was well prepared for war. Britain had radar and effective means of directing its fighter aircraft from the ground. By contrast, the German pilots flew unguided, if not blind. Britain's Spitfires and Hurricanes were more maneuverable than Germany's ME-109s. And not least, the morale of British fighter pilots, who were acclaimed as national heroes, was high. That was not the case in Germany, where Goering drove his pilots mercilessly, sending them on as many as five sorties a day. Adolf Gallant, a leading air ace, quarreled with Goering. Goering said, what can I do to improve your fighting force of your wing? And I was so furious, and I said, uh, Please, Herr Reichsmarschall, equip my wing with Spitfires. Because what you am asking, I can better perform with Spitfire than with the 109. And he said, nonsense, you have the best fighter pilot of the world, best fighter aircraft of the world. The 109 is the most superior aircraft. Compelled to abandon his invasion of Britain, Hitler tried starving her out. The Battle of the Atlantic was an attempt to force Britain to surrender for lack of food. Germany's U-boats, using new bases in Norway and France, nearly succeeded. On any one day, 2,500 British merchant vessels were at sea. In any one month, half a million tons of shipping would be sunk. In 1941, the rate of losses far exceeded the rate at which ships could be built. It was the battle at sea that involved America in the war. The prospect of German domination of the Atlantic was a direct threat to the United States. And by the summer of 1941, the US Navy was helping to escort British convoys. America's growing intervention now prompted Hitler to develop his relations with Japan, whose foreign minister, Yosuke Matsuoka, visited Berlin amid scenes of noisy, if spurious, public acclaim. Hitler wanted Japan to attack Britain's Far East Empire, ideally Singapore, 
He thought that would divert America's attention to the Pacific and so reduce her Atlantic commitment to Britain. In the event, the visit backfired. It helped persuade Americans that the Axis countries were becoming a serious threat to their security. I think that Japan's alliance with Nazi Germany was also a decisive moment for the Americans. The Americans regarded Hitler and Nazi Germany as an evil power. Any country that allied itself with that evil power became to them an accomplice in evil. I think the chances for avoiding war between Japan and America after that alliance was signed were very slim indeed. On the 22nd of June 1941, Hitler shocked his own people and much of the rest of the world by sending three million troops into Soviet Russia. At first, they rolled over the Russian defenses. In his view, the Soviet Union was ruled by Jews. Jews were not able to govern a state. That was one reason why he believed that the Soviet Union could be defeated easily. But this view was supported by many military experts. One must not forget that Stalin had had that uh, period of purges of the army. And when Hitler invaded Russia in June 1941, he, Hitler, was not the only one to expect a very sudden collapse of Soviet Union that was felt by many other observers, not only in Germany, but also abroad in the United States or in Britain. In the first 10 days, the Wehrmacht knocked out 1,200 Russian tanks and much of the Soviet Air Force and took 150,000 prisoners. It seemed like another glorious joyride into enemy territory. We made good progress. The whole sky was full of German planes. No Russian planes in sight. I think it took me four or five days until I heard the first Russian tank firing. And then we had already advanced 100 kilometers into Russia or even more. Uh, in the moment when we went over the border and the action began, it was like that from the moment that we crossed the border and the action began. Open countryside and all the roads full, full with German troops, troops marching, not positioned in the battlefield, but marching on the roads. So, the machine of Strass, the country for the Hügel, the country, the ten thousand dollars. One could from a hill. One could see 10,000 German soldiers at a time. In marching columns, they marched. It, it, it was fantastic. I mean, it was quite ridiculous. It was unbelievable. While Hitler was occupied on his new Eastern Front, the leaders of Britain and America held their first face-to-face -face meeting at sea off Newfoundland. Churchill had come to power just before the collapse of France. Under his leadership, Britain had continued the war alone. He could now hope that Hitler's obsession with Soviet Russia would lead inexorably to his defeat, if Britain, with American help, could support the Russians and keep them in the war. And now the arrival of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill for the historic meeting at sea. Three days of conferences at which President and Prime Minister agreed on a program of peace after the war is over. There was agreement, too, on more immediate concerns. A more active American role in the sea lanes of the Atlantic immediate aid to the Russians, and the Anglo-American response to the threat from Japan. During the summit, Roosevelt cut off exports of oil to the Japanese war machine. American policy toward Japan began to stiffen up all along the line. The idea being that by containing Japan, by eliminating Japan's access to oil outside of the empire, of the Japanese empire, it would be possible to uh, hold Japan in check not only from a southward attack against, say, Malaya or the Philippines and the Dutch East Indies, but also to prevent Japan 
from attacking the Soviet Union from the rear in Siberia at a moment when Soviet armies needed to be concentrated against the Germans uh, west of Moscow. On the day of the German invasion of Russia, Churchill had committed Britain to a full working partnership with Stalin. British supplies dispatched to Archangel and Murmansk that autumn included tanks and 200 modern fighter aircraft intended originally for Singapore. In October, in Moscow, America, still a non-belligerent, agreed to send the Russians a billion dollars in military aid. The discussions in the Kremlin have, thanks to the splendid work of Lord Beaverbrook, Mr. Avril Harriman, and Monsieur Stalin, brought about an infinitely satisfactory understanding between the UK, the USA, and the USSR. By August, the German army is deeply deadlocked in combat with the Soviet Union and the possibility of a co coalition of the Soviet Union, of the United States, of Great Britain, against all possible enemies, Japan and the Axis, uh, could be contemplated with some degree of assurance. One could believe it possible, finally, to defeat Germany. By autumn, it was clear to the Germans that they had badly underestimated the Russian colossus. As the German advance ran out of steam, there was a crucial change in the weather. First of all, the winter came earlier than usual. Or better to say, earlier than usual uh, came a phenomenon what even today you have in Russia, what we call the Schlum period, the period of mud or something like that, with rainfalls and then this started in the beginning of October. And the main reason that the attack against Moscow became so slow was this, not the cold. The most forward tank of my division was in Kerlingin, and the last vehicle of my division was 300 kilometers behind, only because of mud, not because of enemy. That was a problem. And then suddenly, it became really cold in hours to 36 centigrade minus zero. We were not prepared for, neither in our equipment nor uh, psychologically. Most of the German generals wanted to break off the offensive and dig in for the winter. They knew what had happened to Napoleon's army in 1812. Hitler rejected retreat. He asked his Japanese allies to attack the Red Army's rear in Siberia. We could have taken advantage of the Russian-German war, and that indeed might have changed the whole aspect of the Second World War. But even if Japan had launched a war with Russia, the fact was that we did not have enough fuel reserves to sustain such an attack. There were no vital resources in Siberia. In the south, on the other hand, there were fuel reserves which we could rely on if the war dragged on. That was, I think, the reason why we continued with our southern advance. On December the 7th, 1941, Japan successfully attacked Pearl Harbor, America's principal base in the Pacific. To wage war against America, with its limitless resources, was audacious. What encouraged the Japanese leaders was the state of the war in Europe, where the Axis dominated a whole continent, and where Soviet Russia was too preoccupied beating back Hitler to be able to intervene in the Far East. What the Japanese did not know was that the war in Europe was at a turning point. 20 miles outside Moscow, a tank barrier marks the exact spot. A Russian counterattack stopped Hitler's forces in their tracks. In winter for Moscow. In the winter, on the doorstep of Moscow, the German troops sank into the snow and froze to death. 
But at the same time, Hitler knew that this failure came about because of the failure of the idea of the Blitzkrieg. If he had conquered Russia before, he could have faced England and the United States with all his strength. This he was now no longer able to do. A war on two fronts, this he saw, which he'd always feared, was now unavoidable. But if a conflict with the USA was unavoidable, then he wanted to start it. And the attack of the Japanese on Pearl Harbor naturally was a good opportunity. Deutschland, Italien and Japan werden den Ihnen von den Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika und England aufgezogenen Krieg mit allen Ihnen zu Gebot stehenden Machtmitteln gemeinsam bis zum siegreichen Ende führen. Artikel 2. Deutschland, Italien und Japan verpflichten sich ohne volles gegenseitiges Einverständnis weder mit den Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika noch mit England, Waffen, Schützern oder Frieden zu schließen. Hitler kept his promise never to surrender. Long before he shot himself in 1945, what had started in Poland as a local conflict became a global war. The war took 55 million lives, six times as many as the First World War. The aggressor nations, Germany, Japan and Italy, had tried to impose a new world order. The result was not the one they had sought. After 1945, two slumbering giants, who between the wars had chosen isolation, America and the Soviet Union, emerged as superpowers, new rivals for the domination of the world. 